begin with a word of prayer. Our God and Father, we thank Thee once again for this opportunity to meet together to open the Scriptures, learn more about Thee. We thank Thee for the work of Thy Son on the cross at Calvary and all that it means to us today. We ask, Lord, that we be refreshed as we consider once again these great truths in the Word of God. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, um, I've been really exercised about the messages that come from the pulpit and the things that we study and we teach. And, you know, when, when we look at the work of Christ, it is just a momentous thing, isn't it? It's, and yet, as Christians, we often perhaps take it for granted. We may not want to admit it, but it is true. We, we oftentimes take the work of Christ on the cross for granted. And when you think about that event, the, the event that splits time in two, we realize how important it is and how tremendous that truth is and how, uh, how effective it is in people's lives when they consider it, when they come to really consider Christ and his work on the cross and his resurrection. Now, think about the various religious leaders that have come and gone. One of the truths about the religious leaders that have come and gone and made all sorts of claims, whether it be Confucius, uh, whether it be Muhammad, whether it be all kinds of various people who came as Magi or whatever personalities they may want to have taken on for themselves, one of the truths you've got to admit about them all is that they're dead. They're dead. There's only one person that stands out as different, and that's Jesus the Christ, the Messiah. Because, yes, he died, but he rose again the third day. Man, that makes a big, big difference. Man, I want to, get, I want to know the formula, man. You know, we write down formulas. We're mathematicians at OU, Zeppi and I, and we, we are writing down formulae all the time. Well, there's one formula that we really like to publish. And that's the formula for how you can get out of that hole in the ground that's coming for all of us. Let's be quite crude about it. Let's be crude about it. That hole, that ugly, cold hole in the ground where our carcasses are going to end up, we want to know how to get out of that hole. We got the formula, man. We got the formula. Why? Because we've got the person who's already done it. And he is the first fruits of them which sleep. Man, we've got the formula. Now, if you go back to the book of Leviticus, there's a whole lot of interesting things that are there in, in typology. If you look at the sacrificial system, you find there a real bloody mess. Uh, it must have been a tremendously gory thing to see, this sacrificial system. If you go back to Leviticus chapter 1, and in verse 1, it says this, And the Lord called unto Moses, <clears throat> and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them, if any man of you bring an offering unto the Lord, ye shall bring your offering of the cattle, even of the herd, and of the flock. If his offering be a burnt sacrifice of the herd, let him offer a male without blemish. He shall offer it of his own voluntary will at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation before the Lord, and he shall put his hand upon the head of the burnt offering, and it shall be accepted for him to make atonement for him. Now notice that he, that is the person who owns this uh, creature, this flock from which he gathers perhaps a representative that is unblemished. He owns this. And he actively takes of this. And brings it. And then not only does he bring it. Look what it says here. Verse 5. And he shall kill the bullock before the Lord. He kills it. He does it. Now you don't hand it off to someone else to do the, do the job. 
No, no. You bring it and you do it. Now, I never really took notice of that very much. But ponder that. Jesus, when he died, he died for our sins. He took our sins. He took individually our personal sin. We did it, right? In essence, we did it. We did it. He took that sin and he died our personal death. And it goes on here. And it says, And the priest Aaron's son shall bring the blood and sprinkle the blood round about the altar. That is by the door of the tabernacle of the congregation. Well, just do this. Now, this is for one person. Now, multiply this through the camp of Israel. Can you imagine the bloody mess that's developing there? It is going to be red. It's going to be flowing with blood around there. And he shall flay the burnt offering and cut it into his pieces. And the sons of Aaron, the priest, shall put fire upon the altar and lay the wood in order upon the fire. A sacrifice is made. But you notice that the sacrifice is quite personal. It's owned by the individual. And the individual does the sacrifice. The killing is done. Notice something else about the killing. And I want to major on this. Notice the killing is not majored on in the sense that, oh, well, this is precisely how it's done. It just says, here, he shall kill the bullock. There's no indication in here of any kind of torture to the animal. There's no indication in here that what you do is you, you get a knife and you, you torture this animal. No, 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 no. You simply kill it. And then by all indications, it would be done pretty quickly. Woomph. Right? The cut across the throat and the animal would bleed out. And then the rest of what we read took, took place. Christ. Now when Christ, we just read some, pass some passages from the book of John, chapter 19. There you can read about Christ's death. And Christ's death did involve the poking of the knife. It did involve a, a torture of some kind, didn't it? And I think that what we often do is we mistake the torture with the sacrifice itself. The wages of sin is death. Now here's a question for you, and I'm going to, I'm going to provoke you a little bit here. Here's a question for you. If Jesus did not go through the torture but died, would it have been effectual? Well, yes it would. The death. It's the death. Okay, now people, Christians, will often look at Jesus Christ's sufferings, and they were real, and we do learn from them. Don't get me wrong, I'm not denying it. I'm not saying it's unimportant. It is important. But here is the truth. Jesus died for our sins. It's his death that is the significant part concerning the way that we, our sins are taken care of. It is not his sufferings in terms of the torture that he went through. What we learn about the torture that he went through is the extent to which he loved us. The way that he became the captain of our saved salvation. He was made perfect through his suffering. He showed us the true meaning of sacrifice, right? In the sense that what he said he would do, he would not flinch from. He said that he would go to that cross and nothing would stop. No torture, no nothing else. He would go there and he would die. Right? But it's still his death which matters here. Well, up here I've got some interesting things. I started off with this topic on Easter. And, you know, it's kind of interesting. If you look at the word Easter, you know, in your King James Bible, it appears one time. One time in your Bible, you'll find it. And if you look at this topic of Easter, you find it goes back to a pagan idea. Ashtat Ishtar, the queen of heaven. And you'll find the queen of heaven is mentioned in your Bible in these places. You can read about it. And you can find about her offspring. And there's all sorts of interesting stories which have been kept from pagan resources and uh, various manuscripts talk about the fact of this uh, great uh, mystic egg of Astarte 
And what do we find during this time in our societies? Well, there's Easter egg hunts and there's, you know, all of these bunny rabbits all to do with the fertility goddess and so on. So what is interesting to me is how that various pagan activities seem to be around about the same time on the calendar as many of the fundamental truths that we hold to as Christians. And if you go back in time, you'll find that the, in many cases, the Roman Catholic Church would, would say, okay, well, you've got this holiday, so guess what? This holiday really means this. And they would take some pagan idea and then mix it with some, something which was fundamentally true, and you end up with some sort of uh, mixture, which is, can be very confusing to people. But nonetheless, it's happened. Okay, uh, now, just, just come to me with me to the book of Acts. And we could spend a lot of time reading about the, the, the pagan ideas of the word Easter. But I'm interested in this particular passage. Why? Why am I interested in it? Well, here's the thing. In your Bible, you have a word. It's this word here, Pascha. Okay? And it's used many times in the, in the New Testament, and it's always translated as Passover, except here. Now, a lot of uh, Christians and uh, ministers and those who make comments about the Bible, they'll say, would simply handle this and say, well, it's just a mistake. Well, to me, this is kind of incredible. Don't you, don't you think this would be kind of incredible? That this would be a mistake in translation? When you think about these men who were involved with the translation of the King James, these people were not small people in terms of their understanding. These people knew Greek like no one knows Greek today. These people were experts. So are you trying to tell me that all of a sudden they lost their mind? You know, they just lost their mind, man. Uh, in every other place, they translate it as Passover, but here, suddenly, oh, pff, uh, oh Easter. <laughs> I don't think so. Surely we should give it a little bit more respect than that. Right? Surely we should. So maybe there's something about the context of this whole passage which we need to look at. So let's have a look at Acts chapter 12 and verse 1. Let's back up a little bit because it starts off here about Herod the king. Now, Herod the king is not some great Christian man, nor is he some great Jew. He is a pagan. Now, about that time, Herod the king stretched forth his hands to vex certain of the church. Well, that's a nice start. You know, he's going to vex the church. And he killed James, the brother of John, with the sword. Okay, nice guy, you know. And because he saw it pleased the Jews, he proceeded further to take Peter also. Okay, this is going to please the Jews, so I'm going to take Peter. And then it has, in parentheses, a thought, which I think is going to be kind of an important thought to think about. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Okay. And then we come to our passage, and when he had apprehended him, he put him in prison, and delivered him to four quaturians of soldiers to keep him in, uh, intending after Easter to bring him forth to the people. Intending after Easter. Then were the days of unleavened bread. Now, there's lots of passages where in the Old Testament we can read about Easter, not Easter, but Passover. Um, there's Exodus 12, there's Numbers 28, there's Deuteronomy 16. Um, but let's look at this one. I want you to go to the book of Leviticus with me. Leviticus chapter 23. And these other passages I gave you reference to, you can look up later and they basically confirm exactly what I'm showing you here. Leviticus 23. And verse 1 it says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Speak unto the children of Israel, and say unto them concerning the feasts of the Lord... When you shall proclaim 
uh, which ye shall pro proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. Six days shall work be done, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of rest and holy convocation. Ye shall do no work therein. It is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And then in verse 4, these are the feasts of the Lord, even holy convocations which shall proclaim in, the, in their seasons. In the fourteenth day of the first, first month, at even, is the Lord's Passover. Fourteenth. There it is. Okay, that's the Passover. And then it goes on, and it says in verse 6, And on the fifteenth day of the same month is the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Fifteenth, that's the next day, commences the Feast of of unleavened bread okay so here in the black is the unleavened bread okay so that's kind of interesting this first day the passover then comes the feast of unleavened bread in acts 12 3 it says then were the days of unleavened bread well it would seem therefore the passover the jewish passover had already finished so when Herod says, Inten intending after Pascha to deal with Peter, that must, it cannot refer to this because that had already been and gone. So therefore he must be referring to some other Pascha. And that Pascha would be his heathen Pascha, which is Easter. Right? So the context would, would fit far better exactly as the translators gave it. Easter. Right? Surely we should give some respect to the translators and say, well, there must be a good reason for these men to have done this. If you look at the Passover in the New Testament, it's used widely, as you can see. The place where you'll find it used often is in John. Nine times it's used in the book of John. Let's just have a look at some of the places here. And what I found in my studies is when you begin a study on something, a whole lot of truths just start to unravel. They start to unravel. There's some issue in the Bible, like this one to do with Easter, and it's, it is an issue. And you say, why did that happen? Then you look at that word, and all of a sudden, truths start to pop up around this it's almost like god saying hey see this yeah it's a problem right yeah it's a problem oh okay if you investigate this i'm going to open up a whole lot of things study to show thyself approved under god a workman that needeth not to be ashamed rightly dividing the word of truth study it seems like that's what god wants right god wants us to study his word and respect it not say oh that's wrong or you know there's a mistake in the scriptures and you know take the easy way out and if you take that easy way out of unbelief because that's the easy way out man just don't believe the bible just don't believe it that's an easy way out. well guess what happens god will just do this to your understanding that's it man that's the end of your understanding but if you respect his word then suddenly things happen. That's what I found in my own personal life. So if you look, for example, at the, the first place here in John 2. So let's find the gospel according to John. Uh, you find this in John chapter 2 <clears throat> and verse number 13. It says this. And the Jews' Passover was at hand, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Hmm. That's kind of interesting, even as it is. Jews Passover. Two points. Two little points. It's a Jewish Passover. That's the first thing. We just read of the possibility of another Passover. Right? A pagan Passover. Okay, that's one thing. Okay, so the one, it's this particular type of pa Passover. Okay. Two. There seems to be a reminder about Jewish things going on here. Jewish things. Um, 
Look down here at verse 23. Now, when he was in Jerusalem at the Passover and the feast day, many believed in his name when they saw the miracles which he did. Many believed in his name when they saw the miracles that he did. Well, those people were very fortunate in many ways in the fact that they could actually visibly see things to occur. Right? They saw it happen. Isn't it interesting also that relates to the Passover? Because Jesus is the Passover. He is the sacrifice. And as you go through here, you start to discover things about that. Look at, look at John chapter 11. John 11, verse 55. I put these passages up here so that, you know, you can find them. There's other, th other truths in here that I'm going to skip over a little bit, but I'm, I picked these ones out because they were important to my mind. Verse 55, and the Jews pass over. Oh, again, the Jews pass over. In John, what you find is John has to keep reminding people about the nature of things to do with the Jewish connection. That tends to remind me that the people who, who, is, who would be the target audience of this particular gospel are not Jews. I mean, if, a, if, if the target audience were the Jews, why would John be saying to Jews the, past, the Jewish Passover or this was a feast of the Jews? which you find over and over in the book of John. It seems to me that the perspective here is a lot broader than that simply of the nation of Israel. And in fact, you know the famous passage, John 3.16. For God so loved the world. The world. The world. There is this world perspective, right? John's Gospel is very different. If you go back to Matthew, Mark, and Luke, in there, the context is very, very much more to do with Israel, especially Matthew. Man, he, when you read in Matthew, he is presented as the king of the Jews. And when a Gentile would approach him, he would say, you know, I'm not sent but under the lost sheep of the house of Israel, man. But here, John... He reminds the reader of things Jewish, reminds them that this feast is Jewish, and the perspective is the world. It is reminding people about the nature of the Jews' uh, things and their blessings and their sacrifices and their, all of the Levitical um, message that comes with it. Okay, so that's kind of interesting. John 11, um, uh, verse 55 says, And the Jews' parcel was nigh at hand, and many went out of the country... <coughs> up to Jerusalem before the Passover to purify themselves. Okay, cool. Now look at John 12, 1. Then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to a special place, Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. Oh, wait a minute. Passover, Bethany, Lazarus, dead, raised. Man, I don't know about you, man, but this book is made for preaching. It's made for preaching. It's made to point out to you that Jesus is the Passover. He is the resurrection and the life, man. And when you come in contact with Jesus, you, like Jesus, can have life. But how? How will you get life? Because he died. Not simply because he suffered. Of course he suffered. That's tremendous truth. That gives me inspiration to suffer through this life for his name's sake, doesn't it? He suffered. So we learn from that to live a life of suffering and standing by the stuff. But here's the truth. It is his death, burial, and resurrection which allows us to know that we can come up to man. And there was a voice. Lazarus, come forth, man. One day there's going to be a voice. Sepida, come forth! You know, it's going to happen. What a fantastic truth that we will come out of that hole in the ground. We have victory because he had victory. 
And I, I, I just am amazed with this. Look at John 13, verse 1. Now, before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour was come, that he should depart out of this world unto the Father. Oh, man. Oh, Jesus, he's just another prophet. No way, man. Jesus is not just another prophet. He's God in the flesh. Without controversy, God was manifest in the flesh. Without controversy. Now, the controversy will be in the minds and the hearts of the unbeliever. But in the mind and heart of the believer, there is no controversy about this, man. God was manifest in the flesh. Jesus Christ is not just a human being. He's not just another prophet. No, he went back to the Father. He came from the Father. He went back to the Father. Look what it says here, man. Having loved his own which were in the world, he gave up on them because they're a hopeless bunch of losers. No, it's not what it says. He loved them unto the end. That's right. He is the one who went all the way to cross and didn't flinch. He took the torture and the punishment and the suffering and he did what he came to do. He died. And it's his death that mattered for us. It's his death that gives us life. Man, a fantastic passage, you know. Another fantastic passage. We can go on and on with these. And I love to. I want to show you some of the passages that relate to his sufferings and what they mean for us. We can't go through all these. I want you to, to go to the book of Hebrews, writing to the Hebrews, chapter number 2, <clears throat> and verse 9. says this. Well, it's so great, man. You know, I don't want to start there. Uh, verse number 5. Look at this. Hebrews 2, verse 5. For unto the angels hath he not put in subjection the world to come, whereof we speak. First of all, don't you, don't you just love the, the King James English? I mean, okay, I will agree. At times, you don't understand every single word in the King James because it's not our common parlance. That's true. But just read this. Look at the way the thing flows and the way it hits you. But one in a certain place testified, saying, What is man that thou art mindful of him? Or the son of man that thou visitest him. Thou madest him a little lower than the angels. Thou crownest him with glory and honor and didst set him over the works of thy hands. Thou hast put all things in subjection unto his feet. For in that he put all in subjection unto him, he left nothing that is not put under him. But now we see not yet all things put under him. Something's going to come. But we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels for the suffering of death crowned with glory and honor that by grace by the grace of God should taste death for every man and that's my belief I believe he tasted death for every man and when we come to people we can give them the legitimate offer that Christ died and did his sacrifice for them made his sacrifice for them, for it became him for whom are all things and by whom are all, th all things and in bringing many sons unto glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. There's the sufferings. So the perfection comes through the sufferings. And so we can also be made perfect through our sufferings too in following Jesus' example. What do you think is going to happen to people that say, well, I accept the Lord Jesus Christ as my Savior, but the rest of my life, man, I'm just going to, you know, do my own thing. Because I've now got life and that's it. You know, I've got it. It's all done. Not a good direction at all. But what's going to happen to them? Well, I, if they really, truly have trusted on Christ, I believe life is a gift to them. But there's something coming. And the, there's going to be a judgment. And what has been done on the foundation of Christ is going to matter. Now let me just show you something here. Um, it says this in Philippians 3.10. 
that I may know him in the power of his resurrection, the fellowship of his suffering, sufferings, being made conformable unto his death, and the fellowship, the thing that you have in common, of his sufferings. There are some things that we need to search out in common with his sufferings. Look what Paul says here. Who now rejoice in my sufferings for you, and fill up that which is behind, that which is lacking, of the afflictions of Christ in my flesh for his body's sake, which is the church. Paul recognized that there was a, a continuance of work that needed to go on so that the body of Christ could learn certain truths. And he suffered. Paul did. Paul suffered in his body to make sure that these truths would come forth. He did. Look at this one. This is 2 Timothy 2.12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. Well, it doesn't stop there, man. That sounds good. I'll take that. Hey, man. Let's stop right there. Let's not put a colon there. Let's just put a full stop and scrub the rest. <laughs> No, wait a minute. If we deny him, he also will deny us. Now, if we just left it there and just made up our homily on there, you could come up with all sorts of error. So what we're going to do is we're going to just take a little visit to 2 Timothy, right? Let's open up 2 Timothy chapter number 2 and verse 12. Uh, we'll, we'll back up to verse 11. It is a faithful saying, for if we be dead with him, we shall also live with him. Okay, cool. That's salvation by grace. I trust Christ. I died with him. Right, good. That's an identification with Jesus Christ, the Lamb of God who died for us. Cool, I got that. Now, verse 12. If we suffer, we shall also reign with him. There's the rewards, right? If we suffer, we saw Christ suffering, right? And when he reigns, he's got every right to reign because he became perfect through his sufferings. He showed forth the fact that he was going to go all the way to the cross and finish the job. No flinching, no turning, no, all the way. Okay, cool. If we deny him, he, will, he also will deny us. Deny us what? Reigning with him. You'll miss out on rewards. The rewards of reigning with them. Look at the next verse. Here it comes. Verse 13. If we believe not, yet he abideth faithful, he cannot deny himself. What a wonderful thing that he cannot do. He cannot deny himself. He has made promises to us, man. And those promises are based upon his complete and finished work on the cross at Calvary. He came up and we're coming up. Now, what we're going to do in his presence will be based upon our sufferings. How are we going to suffer in his name? What are we going to do with our life? What are we going to do with it? Well, what we ought to do is we need to be busy. We need to be busy in his work. Let us pray. Our God and Father, we thank thee for this message of Christ's finished work on the cross at Calvary, he said himself, it is finished. We praise thee, our Father, for the fact that that work is finished. We have life through his name because he finished that work. We pray also, Lord, that in seeing his sufferings, we also in this life would suffer to bring forth the truth of the gospel, to truth, bring forth the truth of the right division of the scriptures. Make people see, Lord. We see in Paul's example that he also suffered to make known these wonderful truths that we enjoy in this church so much concerning the revelation of the mystery given to Paul the prisoner. We pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen.